for coming. Happy New Year's to everybody. Um, for those of you who this is your first time, welcome to One Million Cup Springfield. Uh, we're always going to have the same program, so we're going to feature two startups, and they're going to do a six-minute presentation, and then we're going to follow up with Q&A. Chat and I are going to be running mics on the side. Just raise your hand. We will come to you and stand up and uh, ask your question. This is definitely an open forum, so uh, if you have some advice, some guidance, uh, a question, comment, or concern for one of our startups, uh, just just raise your questions. If you can, uh, we'll, we'll take the cell phones off unless you have a really awesome ringtone that we can give you a hard time about later. Um, so today, we have a presenter from Kansas City and a presenter from Springfield, Missouri. And without further ado, Marshall Green with Fresh and Blend. combinations of fruit 
that fits that location. So if one location says we really want extremely healthy smoothies with these types of ingredients, we can do that. If the school says we want more protein in our smoothies, they can choose protein-based smoothies that allow them to kind of have a custom so that each location gets exactly what they're looking for. How you can help, talk to places that would be interested. Talk to a gym, talk to your school, talk to a place like this that would like to have a vending machine in their break room. We're doing a uh, crowdfunding campaign right now that you can get more information on, uh, I think online, on the One Million Cup. And we are still raising capital, so if you are interested, want to talk to me about that, and you know people in the area that have expertise in this industry, I'd love to talk to you about that. Excellent. We'll kick off the Q&A here. You can just raise your hand. I'll bring you guys a microphone. The first thing that I want to know is what does a product line look like? Uh, so tell me the different flavors of the smoothies, what are the different ingredient combinations that you can add? So we're trying to stock each machine with four different uh, smoothies to start with. So you have your basic strawberry, banana, blueberry, pineapple, just different ingredients. So there'll be, be three fruit smoothies. And then we're also going to put in a vegetable smoothie in there just so that people can have another option, maybe like a kale, pineapple, and that's why we're going to have the almond juice in there, the almond milk, other almond uh, water even, so that you can kind of have a play with it. If you don't want a dairy smoothie one day, you can get a fruit smoothie uh, the next day and then a vegetable smoothie the next day. Just so that each location can kind of stock it customized to what they to fit their needs. So how far along are you on the prototype process? Do you have something that's functional and working? Uh, we're still getting it functional. We're building it right now. We're in the design phase. We're still designing it and getting it all together and researching the other parts that are out there so that we can do it as, as efficient as possible. But I do have a designer lined up and we're working on the design. Are you? Are you working with a manufacturer on the equipment? Uh, yes, I have a smoothie designer. He's also the manufacturer to manufacture the machine and present uh, to get those going. They had uh, here at the Million Cups on 1210 a Philip Baird, and he had a company called Stingray Worldwide. And they were doing a similar type business, only for uh, sports apparel and paraphernalia. And they're doing the same type of thing that you're trying to do with the same type of, of uh, audience for, for customer bases. And it'd be very worthwhile for you to hook up with Chad and company to... Philip, raise your hand. Where are you at? There he is. You can meet <laughs> Philip right now. Great. <laughs> so tell me, what made you want to go uh, to schools first? Uh, is it because you've got a connection there, or you think that uh, you can stick them in the school cafeteria, and what does that B2B model look like? Schools are already looking for things like this. A lot of high schools, whether they want to or they're being forced by the government, even, they're looking for healthier options. They want to give students healthy choices, but healthy choices are rarely cheap. I mean, they're usually very expensive to make, and school cafeterias just don't want to deal with those high prices. But what a machine like this would do, and what schools would like, is they can put it there so if kids don't want to go out to lunch and get fast food since lunch periods are so short, they can stay in the school and just get a smoothie. So they're looking for these options. They want to have a machine like this in there. There's just nothing like it on the market to fill that need that they're looking for. Um, two questions, actually. Hello? <laughs> nice and hot there, buddy. Good job. Um, you talk about fresh fruit. You know, time schedules are, um, are pretty necessity there. Do you have a, a scalability option that's going to cover that? Scalability is that keeps the fruit frozen. So all the fruit's frozen. All the ingredients are frozen. So that really helps with the shelf life. So, the shelf so it's life refrigerated is, and frozen. Yeah, machine. it's frozen from the time it's shipped, and the machine is actually keeps it frozen so that we don't have to worry about spoiling. Good. The second thing, you talked about giving them options of having either like a fruit smoothie or a protein smoothie. Is that two different machines? No, it'll all be in there. So in the uh, pre-rendered cup, it would have the label on it that says this is a strawberry banana, and it has the ingredients on the side of the machine so you can see, oh, what's in that. This is a protein blueberry, so you can see, okay, there's a little more protein. This one's vegetable with kale and pineapple, just so that you can kind of choose, and there's always going to be an option that you can Very good. Choose. And then last, scalability-wise, you realize that in this industry with smoothies, the ingredient list 
can turn into hundreds, if not thousands, of different things. Right. Do you have a plan in place to cover that when it starts hitting you with all these suggestions that people are going to start throwing at you? Yeah, that's why we are trying to keep it basic. I mean, there's hundreds, if not thousands, of combinations of smoothies. We're trying to cover and we're talking to people, getting what people like in their smoothies so that we can appeal to the masses and keep it fairly basic. We don't want to start having 15 different flavors in the machine. But if the location says, this is what everybody at our school wants, we're looking at that. But we want to keep it basic and appeal to the masses, not get overwhelmed with products and offers. We're going to start four, probably four or five different uh, flavors, just to keep it very simple, keep it all happy. Uh, what's your price point? Is it set, or are they going to be a sliding scale based upon what you choose, or how's that going to work? It'll probably be a sliding scale. That's more up to the vending company on how big the margins they need to make. And for business to business, we go to the vending companies and we sell it to them for a dollar seventy-five, two sixty, as that margin, and then they can mark it up to uh, adjust to cover their costs. We're trying to get the price point, our price point, down so that they can keep the price point selling it from the machine closer to three dollars, three fifty, just so that it can compete with other smoothies on the market. So does anybody else currently offer a smoothie vending machine? <clears throat> not like this. There are a couple, nothing mass produced right now, but nothing with the freshness and the blended on site. There are machines that have smoothie purees in them that you can go to and they'll give you the smoothie goo that people think is healthy and delicious. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing, nothing like this that has the frozen fruit in there that you can see is frozen. It's sitting there waiting for you to choose the customization of adding the liquid. If you want orange juice, if you want pineapple juice, you can add it. So nothing that does it to this level. So do you guys have patents? Are you working on patents for certain yeah, parts the, of the video machine? The machine will be patented. Once we get it, the working prototype made, we can <coughs> patent that. We patent the actual blending process. And then we're also going to patent the cup because we want a cup that is specific to that machine that has to be bought from us, so that it doesn't turn into a Keurig fiasco where people are buying cups from other people. And then, so my last question is, um, so because of the health regulations, a lot of schools have lost a lot of funds because you know an entire athletic department would be run on profits from soda vending machines, right. and then those all went away. So I think there's going to be, this will be received really well. Um, my question would be, I think your biggest challenge is educating the industry and your go-to-market and how you announce that and how you get in front of schools and make them aware that you guys exist. I'm just kind of curious how you guys plan on doing that. For schools specifically, what we're thinking about doing is in schools are always trying to educate their students as to how they can eat healthier, is we'd come in and we'd say, we're going to the whole district and we're going to put three machines in each school in your entire district and there's 2,000 kids in every school. What we want to do for you is come in and hold a seminar where we have a speaker come in and educate everybody for 50 minutes on how they can better improve their lives and eat healthy and what nutrition, just the general nutrition. And then the last five to 10 minutes of that would be more based on our machine and saying, so this is how you use the machine. You can operate it in this way. These are your choices. Just so that the school is happy because they get 45 minutes of free education for healthy and they can say, look how healthy we are. We have a seminar about healthy eating and nutrition. And then we can educate 2,000 people about the new machine that's going into their school and how to use it. So that's school specifically. If a company wanted that, we'd look into that. So I got a question in regards to the size of the smoothies. Are you guys going to be offering one size fits all, or are people going to be able to supersize their smoothies where maybe it's not as beneficial or as healthy? Um, what is your kind of angle at, at tackling that? Initially, it's just going to be a set size, 16 ounces, just to keep it the machine as simple as possible. We, there's a lot of moving parts in the machine. That's kind of the middle ground for smoothies. It's not a jumbo smoothie king, 64 ounce, but it's also enough to fulfill you, and if you wanted a snack or a meal, then it can, it can handle that. Is there a reason that you're wanting to license this to um, companies, to vending companies, instead of handling um, all the way through the cycle yourself so you can get all that money? Yes, there's a very good reason about that, because in the vending industry, it's very, the location procurement is a lot tougher than people realize. Actually going to a school and going to a business and saying, here's a vending machine, it's not as simple as that. People, it's competitive, they have licenses, they're not gonna put the machine in if there's another machine. So we thought it would just be much easier and safer to go to those, com those vending companies that already have the locations and say, you have 100 locations, 
here's a hundred smoothie machines. You can deal with it. They all, they're all going to want it. Put it in the locations that you think are going to make money, just so that we don't have to deal with the location procurement on our end. You mentioned your price point was based off being competitive with other smoothies. Is that your true competition, or is your competition really other vending machine-based products like a bag of Cheetos and a Coke? It's kind of both. Since this is a healthier <coughs> item, it kind of goes against both because people are going to look at the bag of Cheetos and the smoothie, and they're obviously going to have to choose between which one they want. But also, if it's a $7 smoothie, they're going to think, well, at Smoothie King, I can get it for $5. So this would probably be a little higher price than the smoothie you might get at McDonald's or Burger King that they offer. But since it is truly healthy, that kind of counterbalances it. So it's kind of fighting on both those fronts. Well, my I was wondering, we were talking about this earlier, since there's no um, vending machines that currently do this, and you mentioned that there's smoothie machines, but they have pre-mixed uh, smoothie mix. If you're mixing actual product inside of the machine, how do you clean the uh, parts of the machine that are doing the mixing? So that was a very big concern early on that we addressed. And it, we haven't come down to the exact conclusion of what the most cost efficient way is, but it is self-cleaning after each use, whether it's a steam clean or a heat clean that heats off all the ingredients right off the blender or a water clean. But that is being addressed and it's definitely going to be cleaned after each use so that it's not sitting there with smoothie junk on it. My question has to do with your actual product line, and I'm curious what criteria you, criteria you use to choose like what smoothies and so forth, whether it's like uh, sugars or calories or whatnot. So the actual product line itself, we don't have a set guideline. We are just trying to keep it as natural as possible. Your basic fruits, yogurts, uh, low-fat dairy products. But then the issue we run into with schools is since they actually have a set guideline of if it has this many calories, this many grams of fat, can't put it in there. So we are looking at that so that we can offer locations, since that's a pretty good guideline. We can say if it fits the schools, then everyone's going to want it, because the schools have very strict guidelines on what is considered healthy. So if it fits their guidelines, it's going to fit most people's standards as healthy. We're just trying to keep, keep it very natural, no added sugars, no proteins that no one's ever heard of. And two years, Mrs. Obama is going to be looking for a new job. Could she be your spokesperson? I would love it. If you know her, give her a recommendation. <laughs> uh, uh, take me back to the prototyping process. Uh, as we can't see a picture of the machine, and I think everybody's curious of what the inner working mechanisms are. And you may not be there yet. Uh, what has been the prototyping process for you? Are you putting things together with a thing in your garage, or have you found somebody to do it for you? I found a prof professional vending machine designer. He actually designs custom vending machines, so it fits all in line exactly with what I wanted. But we've actually been talking. He's designing it, drawing up blueprints, and we're trying to get the capital to actually go forward and build the prototype and things like that. So what the prototype will look like, is so it'll be a clear machine like you would see on a snack machine with a glass panel so that you can see the fruit, you can see your flavor options. And then you select that, and it actually dispenses the cup to you, so it's in your hand. So you know nothing's getting sneaked in after you bought it, nothing's getting put in there. So you have the cup, and then you put it on the blending tray. So actually a table with a clear plastic shield. You pull the shield down, you select your liquid, say orange juice, and then it grabs the cup, pulls it up, adds your orange juice, and blends it right there on the spot and brings it back down, leaving you with the smoothie. It sounds like you have it pretty well conceptualized. Um, what are the next steps in the prototype phase for you? You've got it all drawn out in your mind, you know what it is, but how do you start putting pieces together and play with it? Capital. We're looking for the capital. That goes back to the crowdfunding campaign, running the crowdfunding campaign, mainly so that we can get this working prototype so that when I go to investors, I can sit down and say, this is what it is. This is the machine. We got it all thought out. We just we need 10 of these. We need 100 of these. So that we can show them the machine that they're actually buying into. Hi, I think it's a great idea, congratulations, and for offering a healthy choice for students and schools. My question is, with the lunch hour being 20 minutes, do you know what your output can be? Like how quick from the time they walk up, decide to the output of the smoothie, do you have an idea of the time? We're trying to keep it under about a minute and a half, which is longer than your average bend, just because it does have to disperse it, and then you have to choose it put it there, choose your liquid, and it has to take it up. 
So it's a little longer, but we're trying to keep it under a minute and a half, closer to a minute, just so that we can get 20 smoothies made in the lunch hour. <coughs> you keep saying you want to put it in places here, like the e-factory, places like schools and everything, like in the airports and whatnot. Uh, and all of those places have one thing in common. People walk through there that are, are trying to watch what they're eating. They're trying to count their calories each day. So on your interface for people, if you consider putting like a calorie counter and whatnot, because the biggest complaint in high schools and stuff is when people playing sports and stuff are trying to count their calories, they can't go up to a vending machine and then they just have to take a wild stab in the dark at how much that bag of Cheetos is going to have in it or whatever they're buying. If you consider putting a calorie counter or like a here's how many I want in my smoothie, and then like suggested smoothies for them, or anything like that? Yeah, so what we're thinking about, since there's kind of a customization with each cup, it would be hard to put it on the cup, but we're thinking about putting it on the side of the machine. If you got, since there's only four smoothies, these four smoothies have these nutrition facts, and then add this <coughs> if you chose orange juice, add this if you chose 2% milk, add this, so that you can really see exactly what's going into it. You know your strawberry banana smoothie has this many sugars, and if you choose your orange juice, then it's going to put you over your sugar limit, so you should choose your pineapple juice, things like that. Yeah, I've got a question and a comment. One on your, your ingredients with the, the almond milk. Uh, how are you going to deal with allergens? You might just comment on that a little bit. Will you have to have allergen warning, or will your cleaning process make it allergen free between the different ingredients if you're switching between pineapple juice and almond milk? And then go back to the business model for just a second around the licensing of the machine. Then are you also selling the cups or are you licensing the technology to create the cup? Will you be the sole distributor of the cups or are you also licensing that capability? So the allergen, hopefully the cleaning process would take care of that. We would make sure that, that's hopefully, but if it doesn't, we'd make sure that it doesn't. And if it doesn't completely and there's any risk, we would have a warning that there might be bits of almond milk or it's running through the same pipe that the almond milk ran through, the dairy milk. So we make sure that there's a warning if there needs to be a warning. And the licensing is we license the machine so that they can have the machines from us and our machines and we are the sole provider of these cups. We want them to buy all their pre-blended smoothie cups from us and we distribute to all of them so that they can choose from our flavor options. Everyone's getting consistently there's strawberry banana smoothie that they love in the morning, always tastes the same, and they there's no play with that. So they're buying all the cups from us. I had a question on you know your prototype for your vending machine. Do you have a projected cost for what that prototype's gonna run as far as what kind of capital you're gonna look to raise? Uh, the prototype itself costs forty five thousand dollars to get that built, to get that working and everything. But then the cost per machine drops down to Four to five thousand in the four thousand dollar range, which is right in line with what a new vending machine costs. A little higher end vending machine, <coughs> but the actual manufacturer of vending machines cost is in line with what a vending machine should be. What uh, are the regulatory requirements for this uh, product, like specifically with the FDA and possibly USDA? There actually are quite a few regulatory things that we're running into. Just you have to get a lot of licenses, fees, make sure that it truly is self-cleaning. They want to know for sure that there's no food being left in the machine. There's no possible chance that anything's going to happen to that food. They want to make sure that the product people are buying is actually what they're buying. So that is kind of more complicated than your normal vending machines. Fresh food vending machines have a lot more regulations than just a bag of Cheetos. Uh, right here. Um, to me, it seems like one of your big concerns will be cleaning the machine. Uh, that may involve needing plumbing or a water line. Uh, if you're going to keep the blender clean to rinse everything out and have somewhere for it to drain out. Because most vending lo locations probably wouldn't have any kind of plumbing available. Is that something you consider? Yeah. So we actually were going with a rinse uh, option, but then once we realized that people aren't going to want to install a vending machine, they want to plug it in, we got more away from the rinsing after each use and more to a kind of steam use or even a heat use. There are options that just blast it with heat and it almost just vaporizes everything off of it. You have a heat option. So we're trying to get away from the water use in the cleaning process. So you're going with just the most popular blends and keeping them in a cup where there's no rinse process. You blend it in the same cup that you deliver it in? Yeah, but then the juice that would be in there would be people want it to be blended on the spot. If it's, they don't want it to question, was that blended two days ago, was that blended a week ago? It kind of gives the 
natural, freshly made feel back to the consumer. People can look at it and say, this is what I'm getting. It's blended right here in front of me. I'm practically making this smoothie. It's right there. It's a very fresh made. Smoothie. What if the frozen ingredients are in it and it's a clear cup? That's like what that's what we have. Okay. Oh yeah. They're just choosing the liquid added. I'm just concerned about the amount of time that you said that it would take to, to mix this up because being in the school sector, it's it's such a time crunch and you and looking at the time format that you've got, probably maybe only ten or fifteen people could possibly get one of the smoothies during a lunch period. And you're looking at four to five periods during the day. Yeah, that's definitely something that we have to take into and see if we can get that time down, see where we can get some numbers down and see if we can get that more in the 30, 45 seconds per blend zone so that we can do that. Well, Marshall, in conclusion, tell us again, like, there's lots to do from prototyping to blending to uh, cleaning mechanisms. Uh, what is the number one thing that you want us all to walk away with when we're thinking about uh, fresh blended on how we can help you uh, so, unless anyone's a vending machine connoisseur, uh, talk to your locations. If you go to a gym, if you go to a school, talk to them, let them know there's a healthy option out there. If you know co-packers and distributors that would deal with this, that's kind of where we're getting stuck, is finding a co-packer that's able to do this. And also check out the crowdfunding campaign that's on One Million Cups and see if that spread the word on that and get the word out there about that. Excellent, thank you. this morning to direct the boys down here. I think that deserves another round of applause. Thank you. For Our next speakers have been a part of the community for quite some time. Uh, they've been in the maker space and I've never seen a couple so passionate about what they do. Uh, but before we transition over to you, I want to give you guys a highlight of what's going on in our community right now. Right after uh, the event today, after you get done swarming our excellent presenters, in the room next door, the, uh, Jeremy Adams and Verve is having Idea Wake Up, and they've got a featured presenter from Verizon. Uh, it's going to be focused on kind of an Internet of Things. If you have a software, if you have a technology that uh, relates to mobile carriers and they need to communicate, this will be the time for you guys to go in there. It's going to be something a little bit more intimate, kind of a round table, and lots of uh, opportunities for participation. Um, the Dream It, Make It, you're going to get more information on this in just a minute. They've already sold out one show, right? And then you'll have another show uh, Saturday at noon at the Moxie. So if you're interested in learning even more than you learned uh, today from Heath and Stacy, then you'll be able to get a chance to do that there. And then Startup Weekend is also going to be this month, and that's uh, January 3rd, 23rd through 25th. Uh, first, I have to give a shout out to our very, very generous sponsors. Um, without asking too hard, we were able to raise a lot of money to make this a really, really good event. And we were able to take the tickets uh, from $100 down to $25 for each of the participants. So first, a round of applause for the E-Factory and for Lake Cups. If you go to Startup SGF, you'll be able to find all of the information there. If you're interested in participating, you can get a 50% discount using uh, the promo code 1MC for uh, the E-Factory since you are here. Or if you're just interested in seeing the pitches, Startup Weekend is an event where teams form on Friday and they've got 54 hours to create a company and then present to a panel of judges, and they're coached and mentored by the leaders in our startup community. If you're interested in getting involved as a coach or a volunteer or a mentor, warm bodies are always welcome. Or if you're just interested in seeing the pitches, you can RSVP a free ticket. We were able to make all of those free uh, for January 25th, which is Sunday evening. I think it'll be about 6 o'clock. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Heath and Stacy Russ with Dream It, Make It. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to come out and listen to our organization and what we're trying to bring here to Springfield, or what we are going to bring here to Springfield. My name is Heath Russ. I'm an entrepreneur, and I've been an entrepreneur for a long time. I also uh, own my own company. I've owned my own company here in Springfield for going about eight years now. We're a main service provider here in Springfield uh, for small businesses, and I work for a Fortune 500 company here in Springfield as well. I have a bachelor's degree in network and communications management. <coughs> Stacey Rust has a uh, degrees in business administration and also social work and works for a, a, another large non uh, nonprofit here in Springfield as well. 
So Dream Maker is bringing the maker movement to Springfield, and we want to make sure that our makerspace has the top-notch, high technology that will offer you guys um, the tools and resources needed to, to create things. So first, let's kind of talk about what is a maker. So as we hear maker, everybody kind of has that notion that, well, I'm not a maker. But everybody is a maker at heart. So you'd be surprised by, if you give people the resources that they don't normally have or the tooling that they normally don't have, they are makers at heart. Um, makers are anything from adults to children. I mean, it could be even children that are um, helping their, their parent create, create a meal or someone, an adult that's trying to make a prototype of something that's not already out there on the market um, that otherwise would not have a, a availability to actually, um, a chance to actually create that uh, without having a makerspace like we're gonna have here. Uh, so what, what we're seeing is people are creating less, or creating more and buying less. As we are such a, such a consumer-based society these days, getting away from our roots of actually creating things and making things and being and having that inspiration of, of bettering products that are out there on the market and innovating them. So our makerspace will look similar to those pictures. Um, it'll be an open area and it will be a place for makers of all ages to come for collaboration and creation. Uh, makerspace members could come in and work on their project by themselves or they might choose to connect and collaborate with other members. We will promote community collaboration by hosting workshops and classes where attendees can come in and learn to make something together. Uh, the classes will be low cost and will be open to the community. And memberships will be $50 per month or $10 for a day pass. They're similar to a gym membership where you come in and you, you pay to use the equipment. And also similar to that is with a gym, yes, you might have some weights at home that you use to work out, but you also pay for that gym membership because of the benefits you get from actually going there. With a makerspace, you might have some things at home that you can make things with, but there's so much more to gain from actually going to a makerspace, having more uh, resources and more opportunities for collaboration. So our mission is to create a community of creatively <coughs> driven individuals who will learn, teach, create new opportunities, and inspire others to do the same. The maker movement is also creating jobs around the U.S. and around the world. It's providing entrepreneurs with the opportunity to start their own business at a very low cost. One example of this is uh, when we visited a makerspace in San Diego, they told us about one of their members who she had purchased an inexpensive cutting board brought it into the makerspace, and laser engraved some personalization in for, for, it, for a gift for one of her friends. Her friend really liked it, and um, she in turn wanted to buy more to give a gift to others. And so this kind of started a trend, and people kept wanting to buy her cutting boards. She now owns two laser engravers herself, and makes these personalized uh, cutting boards full time. As you can see from this infographic, uh, the maker movement is is rapidly growing around the United States. In 2013, venture capitalists pumped $848 million into hardware startups, which is nearly twice the prior record of $442 million. This shows that investors are wanting to put their money into the kind of businesses that are starting in maker spaces. Um, the White House is also taking notice of the maker movement. In 2014, they had their first maker fair at the White House. And uh, President Obama actually calls the maker movement the next industrial revolution. So maker spaces are just at the tip of providing innovation to communities. We like to, I like to kind of start off by kind of highlighting some different companies, some successful companies that have actually started from maker spaces and, and have grown to, to be very large companies today. Uh, the first one I want to kind of point out is most of you may have seen, heard about, um, or even touched or even used, is a 3D printer called MakerBot. That started actually at an NYC, NYC resistor, which is a makerspace in New York City. It has grown to be a billion dollar company as of today. Uh, the second one that we kind of like to, to, I like to highlight here is most of us have probably ran into this or seen it um, or even utilized it in our own businesses is Square, which is a credit card reader. That was actually, most people don't know, but that was actually prototyped at a makerspace here in, here in 
uh, here in the United States as well, because it cut, let them cut costs so much to make, make that prototype. And so they have grown also to a successful company of being over $3 billion um, from just starting from a makerspace. And if they would have never had the resources or tools, they probably wouldn't have been around today because it was going to cost them so much to actually produce that. So let me kind of get everybody's involvement here. That's why I know that we're all kind of getting jittery from the coffee that we had from our big, mama's house, our big mamas. And so let me ask you guys, has anybody here ever had to go through the reins? And I know some of you probably have. Has anybody ever gone through the reins of actually creating a prototype of the cost associated with labor and all of that stuff? So some of you have. Uh, for the ones that have, you probably know, or you know, the cost associated with actually making something, of creating something, making a prototype. It can be very, very, very expensive and can take a long time for you to actually see that physical object. So to give you an example, uh, what kind of spurred a lot of this uh, in in intuition between us two was I had an idea to create an invention. Um, this is actually a scaled down version of it. Um, but it was going to cost me almost $20,000 to make this prototype, just to, just to see it. Um, and that's counting the cost of uh, the AutoCAD drawings, the labor to produce it, and also the, the castings and the moldings to injection mold this, this thing. It was going to cost almost $20,000. Most people would turn away and run. They would not want to try to make, and make something and inspire others to, to build upon that. With our makerspace, what that would allow everyone to do is I could create this exact same thing and see it in less time for under $1,000 and get collaboration with other members to improve this. When you create it yourself and you go through uh, prototyping, you don't get that collaboration. They just take what you have and, and they make it. Well, if you make it and it doesn't come out like you think it's, it should, then, then you don't get that collaboration as you get from our makerspace. So, so we're seeing a big trend of uh, again, of, of, of pe people making more and, and buying less. So some companies I kind of want to highlight here that we think it would be very beneficial for makerspaces, and not only just companies, but, but other businesses throughout, is, um, is to offer R&D, so research and development. A lot of companies have, uh, don't ha they may have R&D departments, but they don't want their normal, the normal day in and day out people to make, to make failures. So we want them to have them opportunity to come to our makerspace to, to, to create failures. I mean, we all learn from failing, but we also want them to have a place to where they can provide that um, added benefit to their employees and not just the health benefits or the paid vacation, but also on top of that, to add that uh, opportunity for people to come out and, and create. So they can make their business more efficient or make something brand new that their company can sell that's gonna make them lots of money. Um, another part would be kind of talking about with the, with the educational system. So when we're talking with universities or Springfield Public Schools is getting the, the kids involved or even the, the, the young adults. Um, it's not just about adults and entrepreneurs. It's also about getting the kids back to actually utilizing some of the tools and resources uh, to, to, to get their hands and feet wet of creating things instead of just consuming everything. So we, we feel that would be a big part of the educational system to actually take part in this and just get the community involvement with that. So we want Springfield, we want Springfield to innovate, collaborate, and motivate others to do the same. We want we urge you guys all to take it to the next level of do it yourself and do it together. Springfield is already a great place to live, as all of us already know. I mean that's why we're here, that's why we live here. But we want to make it even better by providing a high-tech makerspace to each and every single one of us and giving it the right price to, to allow all of us to be, take part in that. Yeah. So he, we, Springfield's got a strong backbone in manufacturing. And as we look at our community and we try to find what are these niches that we already have existing that we can take advantage of, it seems like we're far overdue for a maker space, and it seems like we have a lot of stakeholders who could really benefit from this. Who have you approached, and who are those stakeholders that can help make it happen? So we, we're, we're right now we're in the process of getting the donor funding stages of it, and we've been trying to really network throughout the community right now of, of talking um, with some of these those key players that we were talking about the, the companies and offering corporate membership, 
but also just kind of getting the word out to each and every one of us because it's not just always about the companies, but it's about each and every one of us to have the opportunity to create things. Um, so what we've been what we've been doing is is doing a, basically a lot of networking what we're doing here, but also we're going to be um, doing um, fundraisers throughout the next couple months um, until we actually get a brick and mortar um, to get more people involved to get that awareness out. And so uh, so. If we haven't got to talk to you guys, or if you guys are out there that, that you feel like it'd be beneficial, please come talk to us either after this um, or, or reach out to us uh, because we're, we're we're trying to push, but we're only we're only two people, but we have a couple board members here today that uh, we can network with. But uh, we're trying to get out there as much as we can. But uh, um, please please come talk to us if, if we haven't talked to you already. Got a question for you? Say I want to make a vending machine that makes smoothies. <laughs> Every night when I'm through for the day, do I have to put that in my car and take it home, or do you have the ability to leave things there? Depending on our location, we're hoping to have storage areas because, yeah, people can't just do things, you know, in an hour or two. A lot of projects are going to take a lot of time, so we're hoping to get enough space to where we can have storage areas for everybody to use for their projects. And it may not be something we have right off the front, uh, but we definitely are looking to expand it. I understand you guys are uh, a nonprofit, so the the startup capital will be uh, primarily from corporate sponsors. Can you tell us a little bit about the sustainability, how much cost it's going to uh, take to run the facility on an ongoing basis per annual, and how you plan to sustain those those costs, either with new sponsorships or memberships or however, whatever your sustainability program looks like. So we're we're needing to raise two hundred thousand dollars. I'm hoping to do that within the next six months just so we can get the makerspace open and operational. Um, and the membership pricing of $50 per month, our goal is to have 100 members uh, within our first year. And so as long as we get that 100 members, and we're expecting to grow by at least 50 members per year for the first few years at least, and then I'm sure it will you know, kind of um, slow down. But the, the pricing of the membership will keep us sustainable as long as we can get the donor funding for the actual startup costs. And we do have a fund set up at the Community Foundation of the Ozarks to where donors can contribute there. And also to kind of to add to that is it's with, the, with the membership, as she was mentioning earlier, kind of like a gym membership, it's, there, there is, there's no contracts that are associated with it, but you can also come in for a day too. It's a $10 pass, and that'll actually allow you to come in. Now, that some people have the questions of, well, can we just come in and use any of the machinery that'll be there? Yes and no. So it really kind of depends. If we have, um, you know, a hundred thousand dollar laser cutter that's there, we don't want someone coming in off the streets that knows nothing about it and coming in and breaking it for everyone not to be able to use it. So there'll be some things that'll take some some actual uh, educational stand. We have to take our class to actually use it, uh, and also some registering out some blocks of time. So if you do run a business, you don't come in and utilize the machinery for eight hours to where no one else can use it. So those are some of the the, the interesting tackles. So you mentioned 100. Uh, will that sustain it? Yes, uh, as long as we. Well, we're expecting to grow as well, you know. But um, yeah, with with the 100 starting members, as long as we can keep that base, we will be sustainable. So have you considered pre-selling memberships? We have. I would buy. We've thought. <laughs> we've thought about it. We're not sure how it would go over. So yeah, that would be you know something we'd definitely be interested in. Is, and it's kind of just getting the personal donations. Um, you know, we could do something to where if if you donate a certain amount, you would get your, you know, that kind of pre-registered, you get your first month or two free or however. Yeah. Um, with the maker community growing in a lot of places around the United States, um, is there a network between them where, say, you create an idea here and it can leverage it where maybe get from the right investor and or the right industry to help take it to, to market? Sure, and, and that's a great question, Jeremy. Thank you for asking that. But uh, so let me, let me, there's kind of two parts I want to kind of touch on that. So the first part is with our makerspace, initially starting off, we may not have uh, the tools to get everything to market, but that's where we're looking to, to get um, either uh, partnering with other places, other companies here in town to, to get that to market. So say they come and create a prototype 
at our makerspace and actually want to put it out on Kickstarter or some kind of crowdsource funding and then make it into a business, mm. well, that, there's a lot of stuff in between that from, from making to making a sustainable business. Mm. So we want to we want to actually partner with some, some companies here in Springfield to allow that to happen. But to get back to your question in regards to makerspaces collaborating with one another, that is a it is a, such a huge resource with the maker movement. We've talked to a handful of different makerspaces throughout the United States to kind of hear what they ran into and you know some of their, their do's and don'ts. And they have been very transposed, you know, they've been very open. And it's a very open source movement within the maker communities that we are able to get a lot of good resources and ideas from other maker spaces that they've maybe either failed on or, or seen that's been very sustainable for them. So, so yes, there is that collaboration. And if you ever go to a, a maker fair, um, that you, you, you can see that collaboration between the maker spaces throughout, throughout that area and working together. Um, I, I've done some prototyping design and manufacturing. And, and my question is, some of that is, is a little beyond, uh, I'm going to take a few hours to figure this out. Um, when you're talking 3D CAD and, and some of the, the design elements, will you have somebody on staff that's there that, that some of these, because I mean, you're talking about people, 50 bucks a month isn't very much to, to, to walk over and get some expertise. Um, so will you have somebody on staff that will help that process, or how does that work? To begin with, we probably won't be able to pay a staff. We'll have uh, volunteer mentors who are skilled makers within the community who want to be a part of the makerspace and want to help others. So they you know, will, will volunteer their time uh, to help others. And as we grow, uh, obviously pulling on some more of those experts that will help out within the community and so forth. But if, you go, if, you've, if you've ever visited other makerspaces around the United States, you'll, you'll learn that there's a lot of um, volunteering that goes along with it. And I'm not saying everybody should work for free, but once you get into that space and get into that, that inspiration of working with others, like-minded others, like entrepreneurs like ourselves, you'd be very shocked of how much people want to just explain something that they know that they may not have had a chance to do it maybe at their work or, or in their social life. So, um, so yeah, we, we plan on to grow into that. Okay, so someone has a really unique idea and they come to your makerspace, they develop their prototype, um, you guys provide a really good solution for that. Uh, now they want to look at manufacturing that, maybe ma mass manufacturing, go to market with something like that. Have you guys thought about, um, as an additional revenue stream, maybe having a, a network of local manufacturers or manufacturers that are able to help out with overseas kind of sourcing of manufacturing, and then where you guys would get some revenue share for any business that you guys are able to refer to them? Because I can see, we, part of what Stingray does is we help businesses um, source overseas manufacturing, a very turnkey, which um, is, is kind of hard to do. And so I can see a lot of value in partnering with you. So if someone says, hey, I want to produce a lot of these now, you guys steer them my direction, and then you guys would get a, a <coughs> referral, you know, whatever that might be. But it might be an additional revenue stream to explore. That's a good question. Um, so, so yes, we are looking to hopefully maybe partner with some of the local. I mean, we try to try to keep them local as much as possible, or refer to them if need be. Um, but, um, but yeah. So, so yes, we, we, we do plan on doing that. So that, that's kind of the, the, one of the other big hurdles that we have to try to get over is, is offering that to the people that are there. Because like, like what you're saying, someone can create something and it's like, well, what's, what's going to stop someone from, from taking my idea and stealing it and running with it? But if you look at makerspaces, majority of makerspaces, um, it, with the open source movement, it's, it's not necessarily, we, we try to urge people to take that idea that maybe I have created to make it better. Because if we don't, we're at a standstill. I mean, if we don't ever try to make something better or make that open, um, Dale Doherty, which is the creator of Make Magazine, said if you can't open it, you shouldn't create it. So, like for instance, if you're creating things that have proprietary bolts or proprietary screwdrivers, then you don't you don't you don't necessarily get that um, that maker movement you know, that maker movement at all with those products because you can't open them up to explore. So it's all it's not necessarily about making; it's about learning too. And so we're seeing that, that, that transition coming back to where it's just it's allowing people to open. Uh, but, but the 
answer your question, yes, we are. We want to partner with, with local companies or nationwide companies to provide that opportunity. Um, like Stacy was mentioning earlier, with the company that started creating their own cutting boards, custom cutting boards, they got to the point where they were creating them in house at the makerspace, <coughs> raised so much money they were able to make their buy their own their own laser cutters and create their own business. So what does that do for the community? That makes it a better community. That that makes startup. So um, you'll 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 see that a lot from from our from our makerspace. I, I I almost want to kind of guarantee it because because we have so much passion and inspiration about it that. Um, I know everyone else here does too. So, <coughs> with your uh, nonprofit status and your relationship with Community Foundation of the Ozarks, have you guys thought about looking into any uh, grants or public funding um, to be able to help you raise this money so you can get started sooner? Uh, we have, and we've put in quite a few letters of inquiry, which is the first step, and have not yet received a, a, a positive response. So that's why we are hoping you know, to make it more community-based and get the local donors who want to who be involved. We, we will, of course, continue to, to try and look for resources that way as well. And it, when, we, when we talk about nationwide companies are getting really involved with this, Radio Shack is huge, uh, Home Depot, Lowe's, all of those, those large manufacturing companies are getting on board with these makerspaces because they are seeing what's coming from it. Uh, we're getting back to what she mentioned earlier, is the next industrial revolution of creating things here locally or here in the United States and not outsourcing everything and bringing it in. in yeah. um, another question for you, you kind of tying off of um, what he said, is there is there any kind of business model in this? I know it's a nonprofit where you're helping companies take it from idea to markets to possibly have equity based share in it to help funds on a reoccurring side of things. So we haven't looked a ton into that, just because we are pushing kind of the open source bill. We're not, we're, so it could potentially, potentially lead into that to where we could make some more revenue back for the makerspace to obviously invest more into to more higher tech equipment. Um, there's actually a, a trend with makerspaces that we're seeing now that we hope to incorporate in R is kind of being um, a go-to for people that have ideas but don't, that don't want to create it, they just have the idea. And so they come to us and we create the idea for them and maybe do a kickback for them and maybe sell that product online or whatnot. Um, so there's other, there's there's not, there's only very, very few companies out there that are actually, or makerspaces that are actually doing that, or companies that are doing that, but we're hoping to incorporate that into Springfield too. Um, so what that, that in re other return is, is so say some of the, uh, the local companies here in town want to come to us and have an idea, and you don't necessarily have the staff to create that idea. Well, I can guarantee at a makerspace, we're going to have all sorts of ideas that will be floating around the air um, that we can have the community get involved to create something for you. Um, so what that would do is we could post out special projects to where the people that are makerspace or that are members at our makerspace can collaborate with one another to to create something for a local company in town and, and have that self-respect that hey, I helped create some of that stuff for the company. And kind of to expand on that, um, I mean, when someone has a successful idea and it does grow and we, we're not going to want to take royalties from that or anything like that. What we would uh, in turn hope for is for them, you know, when they're successful that they would give back and just be a donor to this. You know, just to so it's similar to like when you go to, go to educational systems after you graduate there. We're not going to be calling people that says it's often they probably do, <laughs> but we'll urge them to want to donate back to our, our makerspace to make it a So I, I noticed there you got uh, some pretty heavy hitting assets with 3D printing, CNC machining, laser cutting, and I, I heard with the $50 membership, um, which could cover it. Now, how are you going to handle materials? Um, you know, a sheet of sheet metal is way over $50. So, I mean, are you guys, guys going to have a coding process, or how, how would you see that happening? We won't provide the material. People, if you have a project that you're working on, you'll need to bring in the wood or the metal or whatever it is that you're wanting to work with to make it. Um, we'll provide the basic tools and equipment, but as far as the materials to actually make the project, people will need to bring those in. We will um, you know, partner with local uh, distributors who can maybe give our members a discount if they purchase wood from them or materials from them. And another thing too is we'll, we'll kind of reach out to companies like me and all of that stuff. A lot of times they have scrap lumber or, or scrap metal that 
they don't know where to donate it to or they don't know where to, to take it off or upload it to, that we'll kind of open our doors to allow them, uh, depending on what it is. I mean, we don't want some things that are just junk that people probably won't have any, be able to have any, uh, to make anything from it. But, but trying to, to partner with them to, to donate to us instead of taking it to a recycling center or something like that to where then we can offer some of those free materials to the, to the members. Um, right here. So uh, there are some really good crowdfunding platforms that are specifically targeted to nonprofits. Have you looked into crowdfunding uh, as an option? And also just um, really more of a comment, um, it seems like liability is going to be a significant um, issue and cost. Uh, is that something that, um, that you've looked into? We have looked into crowdfunding. We currently have a GoFundMe uh, account and a set up for it's raising the money for our first piece of machinery, which is the laser cutter. So we do have that already established, and we will be kicking off a Kickstarter sometime within the next couple months. Um, as far as the liability, we've we've looked into the insurance, and we you know we're we're getting a good idea of, of what that's going to entail. So yeah, we are aware, and also as far as when we've talked to the other maker spaces, so we will definitely have a plan set up for that. Guys, before we wrap it up here, I'd like you to just go back over how can we as a community best help you? As we've been talking about, funding is definitely our number one thing that we need. We need local companies who who want to partner with us and, and even individual donors who, who want to be a part of it. Uh, we, we do need space. We've looked at a few locations around town that haven't narrowed anything down yet. So we're looking for around 5,000 square feet to start with. So uh, we will also need makers. We're going to need skilled makers who want to come in and assist the other people who aren't as skilled at using a piece of machinery or at making something to help them. And then we need everybody else to stay in touch with us, follow us on Facebook, on Twitter, and join us members once we are open. And then we need accounting and legal assistance because we do want to make sure uh, that we're covering our liability, that we're doing everything correctly and following all the correct procedures. So to kind of end it, guys, we, we really do appreciate you guys coming out to listen to us. As much exposure as we can get to the community, we, 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 we love to do and, and try to get you guys educated because a lot of people just don't know what the maker movement is or may have heard about it but don't understand it. Um, so we do urge you to come out this Saturday to, to learn more about the maker movement. Um, it is a free showing, so there's no cost associated with it unless you guys want to donate, which we urge you to do as well, but, uh, uh, but it is free. And, and like we mentioned earlier, the first showing is actually already reserved out, um, so we've opened up another one at 12 um, to show, show to give it out to more of the community and so forth. So thank you guys for coming out today. Thank you One Million Cups for having us out. And uh, um, if you guys have any questions, please feel free to stay out around afterwards and ask us. We'd love to. Awesome. Thank you, Heath and Stacy, and also Marshall. Great presentations to uh, kick off uh, 2015. And thanks to everyone here for coming out on such a cold day. We really appreciate your attendance. And uh, I want to remind everyone that uh, Devin and Chad, Dev and I are constantly, and I mean constantly, looking for companies that would benefit from presenting in this space. So, it seems like I ask this every time I get up in front of you, and I'll continue to do so. But if you know somebody that will benefit, please go to our website, One Million Cup Springfield, or have them contact myself, Chad, Devin, Deb, because we'd love to talk with them. So, again, we'll see you next week. Thanks for your support. Thank you.